This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. All right, this is the uh, second lecture on Chapter 23 of the free course notes, still looking at the Consolidated Statement of Financial Position. Um, and in the previous lecture on this chapter, I started to explain the rules about the non-controlling interest. Um, in the second example, so if you've got the lecture notes in front of you, in example two, um, we've got a full example there. And I'll go through the rules. We'll look at each bit of working separately and then produce a full statement. So have a look at example two with me. Have a quick read. P acquired 60% of the shares in S on 1st of January 2007. So we control it, we're going to produce a consolidated statement, but we don't own all of it. There's a non-controlling interest, the other 40%. They acquired 60% when the returned earnings of S stood at 6,000. The fair value of the non-controlling interest at the date of acquisition was 30,000. Well, that was 2007. In 2010, the statements of financial position of each of the two companies were as follows. So I'm not going to talk through them, except in P's statement, you've got the investment in S at cost. So they paid 40,000 for their shares. And as I say, we're going to I'll go through the workings for each bit and then we'll produce the full statements. And so example two itself says calculate the amount of the goodwill arising on consolidation. So let's do our workings for goodwill. The first thing, let's write down how much the um, S was, if you like, valued at, at the date of acquisition. We know how much uh, P paid. So the cost of P shares I'll read that, P's shares. Uh, from their statement of financial position, they paid 40,000. But remember, that was only the value being placed on 60% of S. What about the other 40%? Well, I told you in the last lecture, almost certainly you'll be given the figure, and so the fair value of the non-controlling interest, which was the other 40%, the question tells us it was 30,000. Now, I'm not worried where that figure came from. Use whatever you're given. If you're not given a figure, you'd say, ah, oh, 60% is worth 40, therefore 40, the other 40% is 40 sixtieths of 40 but almost without question, you'll be told the fair value. So the total value uh, being placed on um, S at the date of acquisition was 70,000. Uh, what value would have been in their statement? Remember, as far as S is concerned, we take S's share capital. Uh, 20,000. I did say uh, when we were going through the previous chapter, we always assume the share capital hasn't changed. It was 20 now, it must have been 20 uh, at the date of the acquisition. Uh, in addition, we take the pre acquisition retained earnings. Uh, look at the first uh, line. The shares were acquired when the retained earnings stood at 6,000. And so the date of acquisition, the net assets of S uh, in their statement would have been 26,000. We may have uh, thought the assets were worth more, the fair value adjustment. Mm 
Again, we went through this in the uh, previous chapter. But if they said um, the assets were worth 10,000 more than the carrying value, we'd have added it on. Here, there's no mention of a fair value adjustment. Therefore, the carrying value, 26,000. Why did we pay 70? Oh, not pay 70, sorry. Why did we decide it was worth 70? The difference is the goodwill arising on consolidation. Seventy minus twenty-six is what? Oh, Forty-four thousand. All right. So there's the first bit. <coughs> I said we we're doing the workings for each bit separately, and then I put it all together as a statement. But there we are. There's the full workings for goodwill. All right. If you look at example three. Another bit we need to calculate, what was the non-controlling interest at 31st December 2010? Remember, we're going to prepare a consolidated statement at December 2010. We've got the goodwill figure, but we also need this non-controlling interest. Because if you remember from the previous chapter, although, uh, sorry, previous lecture, although we're, we're going to end up bringing in all the assets, all the liabilities, not everything's owned by the parent. Some of it's owned by this other 40% the non-controlling interest. Well, we want to know the value of it at 31st December 2010. We take the fair value at the date of acquisition. Which look back to the question, it's the same information, it's the same question as example two. Uh, and it says the second line, the fair value of the non-controlling interest at the date of acquisition was 30,000. However, that was the date of acquisition 2007. We're now at 2010. And they're going to be worth more because the company's earned more since then. And so how much extra are they worth? We bring in the non-controlling interests share of the post-acquisition profits. Thirty thousand is what we decided they were worth, or we were told they were worth in um, two thousand and seven. By 2010, there's more profit being made, uh, and the non-controlling interest is entitled to their share of it. What share are they entitled to? Well, P owns 60%, the non-controlling interest owns 40%. And how much has been earned since acquisition? Well, in 2010, from the statement, the retained earnings are 16,000. At the date P acquired the shares, the first line, the retained earnings were 6,000. So S has earned 10,000 since date of acquisition. And therefore, the non-controlling interest are entitled to 40% of that 10,000, 4,000. And so there's our second bit of workings. And incidentally, in multiple choice questions in the exam, uh, any one bit of this can be asked. And there could be several uh, multiple choice questions, but you know, two marks, what's the non-controlling interest, or two marks, what's the goodwill, and so on. But there we are, the non-controlling interest always, the fair value of the date of acquisition, plus the non-controlling interest share of the post-acquisition profits. So, we know what the goodwill is, we know what the non-controlling interest is. 
The final bit of workings we need, and then we'll be able to do the statement, is the retained earnings. Uh, and again, if you look back uh, to the earlier lecture, um, the retained earnings in the consolidated statement are the retained earnings belonging to P. And so the uh, consolidated retained earnings, it's always all of P's retained earnings. And look back at example two where the figures were. P's retained earnings were 44,000. As far as S is concerned, it's P's share of the retained earnings since acquisition. So what's P's share? 60%. What are the post-acquisition retained earnings? We did a minute ago. The 2010 total retained earnings are 16,000. At the date of acquisition, first line, they were only 6,000. And so, P's shareholders are entitled to 60% of 10, 6,000. The total retained earnings uh, for a consolidated statement, 50,000. All right, so those are the three bits of workings you must make sure you're confident about. Goodwill, non-controlling interest retained earnings. But having done those three bits of workings, I can now prepare the consolidated statement. So effectively, this is example five in the notes, but it's just putting everything together. So keep looking at example two where the figures were. First of all, the non-current assets. Add them up. 50 in P, 30 in S, a total of 80,000. There was no fair value adjustment here. Had there been, you would have to add that on to the 80. The new asset has appeared, the goodwill arising on consolidation. Uh, we worked that out earlier. What figure did I get? 44,000. And finally for the assets, the current assets. Add them up. 14 in P, 12 in S, 26,000. And so the total assets on the consolidated statement, uh, 150,000. Uh, equity and liabilities, share capital always is the share capital of the parent company. The share capital of the parent company, 50,000. In addition, the retained earnings belonging to them. We've done the workings, so I'm not going to talk through them again. For the retained earnings, 50,000. So of the total assets of the um, combined company, the group, 100,000 effectively belongs uh, to the shareholders of P. However, because P didn't own 100%, some of the company belongs to the non-controlling interest. Again, we've done our workings non-controlling interest, uh, they're worth 34,000. Uh, finally, current liabilities. 
simply add up. Uh, 10 in B is 6 in S, a total of 16. And therefore, the total, 150,000. And there we are. In that example, we've got almost everything. But do, do, do go back and learn how we calculate each of those three main figures. Non-controlling interest, fair value of the data acquisition plus their share of post-acquisition profits, group retained earnings, everything in the parent plus the parent's share of the post-acquisition profits in the subsidiary, and goodwill. I've lost it. Oh, the, the goodwill. We get the total, what you might call, value of the company, of S. So it's what P paid plus the fair value of the non-controlling interest of the data acquisition. And you compare it <coughs> with the value, effectively, of the assets in S, the data acquisition, share capital plus pre-acquisition uh, retained earnings and possibly a fair value adjustment for non-current assets. Well, I say that's virtually everything. However, I will need one more lecture on this chapter uh, to do with what we call inter-entity transactions. Because we do have two separate companies, remember, P and S. But you can have a situation where P has been selling goods to S, or S has been selling goods to P. And as you'll see, uh, it, it does mean a little extra adjustment. But that's the next lecture.